This is going to be about George Higgins on writing. When I got a copy of The Friends of Eddie Coyle, I noticed that the author, George Higgins, had written a book about writing. In addition to being a journalist reporter and a prosecuting attorney, the perfect combination to write his signature book, Higgins had also been a college professor of creative writing. The book was called On Writing, Advice for Those Who Write to Publish or Would Like to. There's a parenthesis in there, and he favors that punctuation. Inside those curves, he dishes the inside dope, the confidential stuff, as if in a conspiratorial whisper. In this book, Higgins is very much the professor. There's no hint of Eddie Coyle. Here's an example. It follows that the greater the emotional propinquity of the parties, the higher will be the intensity of their dependence one upon the other, and the greater the passion provoked by one's perception that the other has betrayed him or her. Thank you, Dr. Higgins. Higgins calls writing this regimen a serious trade, arduous, ars longa, vita brevis, he says that reading aloud is the finest way to judge quality. I can believe that because the sense that dominated Eddie Coyle was hearing, the rhythm, cadence, the ear. Reading the masters is also the path to good writing, and Higgins gives many lengthy examples. He begins with Dickens, who is excellent, but long. Dickens, who called himself the inimitable, could go on. Uh, in this piece uh, that Higgins uses, he sets the scene for Bleak House. It's a big, bleak production. I have heard that he was paid by the word. I can believe it. It shows. He is prolix. He is often abridged. Higgins frequently refers to Hemingway, always with approval. When it comes to Fitzgerald, he respects Gadsby and ridicules most of the rest. He thinks the official canon contains some real weezers, especially George Eliot and Middlemarch and Margaret Mitchell Gone with the Wind. I can also toss the Red Badge of Courage on that pile, a celebrated book, but I thought it was all phony baloney. He dismisses Gore Vidal and Thomas Wolfe as well, saying that Wolfe was overly in love with himself, saved somewhat by his editor, Maxwell Perkins, who also worked with Hemingway and Fitzgerald. His comments came as a great relief to me. I have, not, I have read not one of those weighty tomes by Wolfe, and now I feel free not to do it, ever. He approved of Gay Talese, who was not my favorite, for several reasons. He liked to write enormous serpentine sentences. Higgins thought they rolled past like long freight trains, and that they had to be long because they were hauling so much weight. Maybe so. I thought that Talese did it because he liked to do it. It made him feel architecturally superior. It was an indulgence and a show-off, and I found it irritating. He also dipped into the celebrity cesspool. The piece Higgins provided is on Joe DiMaggio in Middle Age, and Talese still considers him a hero. For Talese, in one hilarious paragraph, even his nose is heroic. I don't go in for heroic noses, and I thought Joe was an old sourpuss, stewing in the past, baseball and Marilyn, and often behaving like a pouty six-year-old brat. William Manchester is, is included, the preamble to Goodbye Darkness. I have mentioned Manchester's powerful wartime work. John O'Hara, not the novels, the short stories. He wrote about social class and status. He specialized in communicating what was not expressed. He did it by reference, writing in code. It is perfectly true that you could put one of his most excellent stories before a young person, and they would not get any part of it. They do not know the code. It slips past them unnoticed. The same fate will be for that sly fox O'Hara himself. John P. Marquand, I know of him, but I passed on him because I had no interest in his subject matter, the behavior and affectations of the upper class. 
For E.B. White, he sends us to Charlotte's Web. Okay. And he admires James Thurber. Thurber is one I used to like for his classic humor pieces, Mitty and the Catbird Seat, but the more I read him, the less I liked him, until I read him no more. Higgins was earnest and frank, so earnest and frank that he actually said that it helps if you know what you're doing. Writers say stuff like that. I don't think you'd hear it from a plumber, a carpenter, or an electrician. They know better than to say stuff like that. Higgins did not think that writing could be taught, and here he was, teaching it, and writing a book, trying to do that. It was like watching a good man caught in a trap, a trap of his own making, clamped down firmly inside those damn parentheses.